hello again. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest preacher today. This is Pastor Steve Norman, and for over 25 years, he has served the local church in Michigan as a church planner, a lead pastor, a teaching pastor, a a coach, a a motivational speaker. He does a lot. Uh, I had the pleasure of being in this service, first service, so I know that you're in for a treat and you're going to be a blessed because Pastor Steve is going to bring a message that I really think is going to challenge us and encourage us to, to live our lives differently, to, to go out in this world and to do things for God. Would you join me in welcoming Pastor Steve Norman? Thanks, Keith. It's an honor to be here. My wife, Kelly, and I have uh, been blessed both directly and indirectly through the great work that Shoreline is doing. We've had a chance to observe it over the last couple months from a distance and are so grateful for the church that you are and the people that you continue to become as you lean forward into the dreams that God has for you, uh, for your families, and for your church. Let me pray for us, and then we'll we'll dive into the Word together. Father God, I thank you for today and the gift that it is. Uh, You say every opportunity that, that we're drawing breath, we can rejoice and be glad. Because you've given us the gift of life, and you are leading us into into full life, into a vibrant life, into a three-dimensional existence that comes with knowing and trusting and following you. God, I pray that if there is anything in the seen or unseen world that would prevent us from hearing your voice, that you would remove it now in the name of Jesus, that you would give us eyes to see you, ears to hear you, and hearts to trust you for our next step. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. So last month, my family, along with a couple other million families from Michigan, went down to Orlando for spring break. And we had never been to Universal Studios before, but everybody who had gone said, hey, when you go, you have to go to this Harry Potter attraction, Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure. So we're like, okay, great. My wife, Kelly, had heard from another family that they went all the way down there that was on the top of their bucket list, but the park was so crowded, they never hit it. So we said, we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen to us. So on the first day that we're at the park, we get up, we drag all four of our kids, our 17-year-old, our 15-year-old, our 13-year-old, our 11-year-old, out of bed at the hotel at 6 a.m. We walk to the park in the dark. We, we're among the first people to clear security when it opens, and we're standing right in front of the gates with a second family back. We're like, okay, they, we're, we're, we're in a good spot. We're like in a prime position to succeed here. And then we start looking around. We're like, there's nobody else here. Maybe we should have slept in like all the normal families. Uh, But then as it came closer and closer to 8 o'clock, that magic time when the park opened, we looked behind us, and sure enough, the crowd that had started with dozens had swelled to thousands, and we're like, huh, maybe it was a good idea. And when the gates opened, there was this mad sprint for our lives. Like, we're rushing to the back corner of the park where the attraction is. Two of our kids are ahead of us. Like, I'm sweating. My calves are aching. I'm like, I'm too old for this. I didn't sign up for this part of the vacation. This isn't fun anymore. And then sure enough, we get to the attraction. We're among the first people on it. And and again, you you wait in line for like a long, long time to get on the ride, and the ride lasts all of what, like 90 seconds? The ride is done, and we come off the ride, and they had put that number up. You know how sometimes they'll put up the sign that said, this is how many waits, how many minutes you have to wait in order to get on this ride? And it said 240 minutes in order to get on this ride. And so we looked at the family, we're like, was it worth it? And we're like, absolutely, yes. Norman's one, universal zero. Like, we, we are conquerors. Have you ever noticed that there's only two kind of people who go to theme parks? There are wanderers, and there are warriors. And warriors are like, I know, like, when you go to Disney World, you're like, I'm going to run to the far end of the park, and I'm going to work my way back because that's what champions do. Wanderers, they wander in, they're like, oh, look, churros. And you're like, no, the churros are a trap. Don't fall for the churros. Get to the rides, you know? Like, so if, if you have, there are families who like, they go on vacation to rest and there are families who go on vacation to win. Uh, do you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying there? And, and, and the winners were more exhausted when we get back than we were when we left, so the whole thing might like, be counterproductive. But when, we go, when, our, when the Normans go to a theme park, we are on a mission. Like We know what we want to do, and we know how we want to do it. One year, we were at Disney, and the rides were shut down temporarily because of rain. And I pulled aside the cast member who was working on Splash Mountain, and I go, I go what's the Disney formula? I go, how many rides are you anticipating that we'll do in a day? And she goes, well, actually, the business model works like this. Disney thinks that you will do one attraction per hour. And I was like, then we will beat the house every single time we come. <laughs> so we, we, we've got a mission. We're going we're to average more attractions per hour, uh, per hour than what they expect of us. So when you have a mission, you will give up certain things like sleep or comfort in order to achieve that mission. Am I right? Yesterday, my wife Kelly and I were on a different sort of mission. Uh, we went to Point Lobos National Park, and our, our goal was just to, just to go for a six-mile hike. 
to go for a walk, to soak in the beauty of the coast, to enjoy one another's company. And it wasn't until we were a couple miles into this hike that somebody told us that this is the time where you can see harbor seals. And you can see harbor seals pups, apparently like April and May are birthing seasons. And so, that, and so now I had a new mission. I was like, I must see a harbor seal. Otherwise, this whole excursion was, was a waste of my life. And um, so we're, 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 we kinda, we're, we're working around Bluefish Cove, and we see a small crowd there. And a guide is pointing out that if you, if you kind of looked over the edge of the bluff, you could see 19 harbor seals, including their young, on the beach. And so like we got, we got our pictures. We were super excited. And I turned to my wife, Kelly, and I said something that just doesn't make any sense in hindsight. I go, mission accomplished which was silly because a half an hour before that moment, I didn't even know that I had that mission, right? It was one that I picked up along the way. The truth was, like hiking six miles, that was, that was still two miles down the road. Have you ever noticed that you can start a day with a mission and then you can pick up another mission along the way and the second mission can distract you from your first mission? Jesus wanted to make sure that his disciples were crystal clear on what the mission focus for their lives was, which is why he said these words that were recorded in his biography by Matthew, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The word there doesn't mean countries, it means people groups. The Greek word for nations is ethnos. That's where we get ethnicities. Baptizing the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, I want you to join me on my mission to pull people from all corners of the globe into a knowledge and a trust and a faith in me. And if his mission is to be my mission, then I must go as he went, to to go out of my comfort zone, to make disciples, to baptize people in his name and to teach them to trust and obey and to follow him. Going isn't a once and done proposition. Sometimes you're like, oh, I, I went, I did a mission strip, or I did a service project. Like, I went, now I'm done going. In reality, when his mission is our mission, our going is to be ongoing. We never stop going. Every day we roll out of bed, we've got mission on the mind to say, who is it that God wants to bring across my path today? who doesn't yet know of his love or his wonder or his beauty. I think as we go, God leads us into different kinds of spaces. He leads us into new relational spaces. He leads us into new emotional spaces. And he leads us into new cultural spaces. So let's look at that list for a moment. God leads us into new relational spaces. He leads us to rub shoulders with people that we would never find ourselves in the same room with if it wasn't for the prompting and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We read this in Acts chapter 8. There are an early fo- group of followers of Jesus have been living in the city of Jerusalem. They've received the Holy Spirit. But one of their friends, Stephen, was speaking up the name of Jesus. He was causing some controversy because he was loving some people that others thought didn't belong in the family of God. Uh, he was persecuted and he was ultimately executed. And as the result of Stephen's martyrdom, the early church was scattered. They're, they're fleeing Jerusalem for their lives. And this is where we pick up the story of a man named Philip. It says, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in a chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. You know what I love about this passage? God doesn't give Philip all of the instructions, he just gives him one instruction. He goes, go camp out by this road. Can you imagine God saying like, just go by Route 68 and wait there for further instructions. Like that doesn't sound like a good idea. How many of you like want God to give you the Google Maps version of how things go? Like tell me where I'm starting, tell me where I'm ending and tell me like where all the cops are in between, right? Like that's, that's what I want, that's what I want to know. Um, how many of you learned the hard way that Jesus doesn't work that way? He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead you one step at a time. So God leads Philip to this road. On the road, he sees a chariot. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. How awkward if the Lord's like, hey, go lurk creepily by that minivan and wait for further instructions. (laughs) Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. So he's reading this out of a scroll. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. 
This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch didn't see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So the spirit finds Philip in a moment of crisis. What's he doing? He's running for his life. He's a refugee. Philip doesn't want to be on the road to Gaza. Philip wants to be in Jerusalem, where his home is, where his friends are, where his comfort zone is. But God used challenging circumstances in his life to strategically place him in the path of a person who needed Jesus. And if you're going through a season in your life where you are not where you want to be, know that you are right where God needs you to be. And you might be in a season or on a path or in a job or in a situation that you didn't necessarily choose for yourself. And you're trying desperately to get out of. But God has you there, not for you, but for somebody else. So open your eyes and your ears and say, God, as long as I'm here, will you use me to help somebody find their way back to you? But God directs him to someone who is different from him in every way. The Ethiopian was different from him ethnically. He was different from him culturally. He was different from him sexually. But Philip obeys the Spirit's prompting and the Lord leads him into a divine encounter. And as a result, the eunuch is baptized. And where does the eunuch go? He goes home. What does he do when he gets there? He tells other people about Jesus. Have you ever noticed that it's more efficient for God to reach a tribe from somebody who's a member of that tribe rather than sending an outsider into that tribe? God saved, like Philip, a lot of frequent flyer miles by uh, allowing the Ethiopian to go back to Ethiopia on the gospel's behalf. Now, over 20 years ago, my wife Kelly and I had a chance to be at a very, very intriguing service project. Uh, back in the day, they, this, they did this in California as well, but there was a thing called the Tangeray AIDS Ride, and it was designed to raise fundraising dollars for AIDS research. And cyclists would bike 500 miles from Minneapolis to Chicago. And then support crew went, and they, they were, did pit stops along the way, they offered medical support, and my, my team, our volunteer job, was to pack up all of the gear, all of the luggage for a 1,000 people, collapse the tent city, put it into 13 box trucks, drive it 100 miles to the next town, and unpack it all. So we were, we were kind of the, the, the gear crew. And some of the people on our team knew that I was a pastor, but because they had been hurt by the church or been skeptical of the church or boxed out by the church, many of them kept their distance, including one woman that I rode with in our box truck on the very last day. So she's driving the truck. I'm riding shotgun. We, we looked like Philip in the Ethiopian unit. We couldn't be any more different. I'm in my 20s. She's in, my, she's in her 30s. I'm white. She's black. I'm straight. She's gay. I'm a pastor. She's a train conductor. And we had zero in common. So it made for a really awkward hour and a half ride. And then out of nowhere, she just says, okay, I got a question. I said, what's your question? She goes, you believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus is the only way to redemption and forgiveness and paradise, right? I go, yeah. She goes, don't you think that's unfair to all of the other world religions that teach there's a different path? And I had no idea what to say. And so I go, Lord, a little bit of help, like like immediately. (laughs) And these words came into my mouth, and I'm not smart enough to think of them on my own, so I will credit the Holy Spirit for this one. I said this to her, I go, Imagine that you are in a house that's on fire and every exit except for the front door is blocked with smoke and flames. I go, will you stand there and curse all of the other exits for being unfair to the front door? Or will you take that opportunity to run for your life? And without taking her eyes off the road, she said, I get it. I don't like it but I get it. 
Now, I would like to tell you that she immediately pulled the car over to the side of the road and we baptized her in a retention pond and continued with our way. That's not what happened. But did you know that like mission is, doesn't always have to result in a decision? Mission is just being where we're supposed to be when God tells us to be there and saying what we're supposed to say when God tells us to say it. I think sometimes on mission we get overwhelmed because we're like, oh, I didn't get outcomes. Like this person didn't pray the prayer. This person didn't get immediately baptized. That, that's in their hands and God's hands. It's our job to simply be faithful, to be surrendered, to be obedient. But when you follow God on mission, he will lead you to rub shoulders with people that you would not encounter under any other ordinary circumstances. God leads you into new relational spaces. He also leads you into new emotional spaces. As I go, God leads me to, through emotions that I might not even be able to predict. Now, in some cases, God will propel you into mission with joy. In other cases, God will lead you through paralyzing fear into contact with people who need to hear his voice. Listen to the story of a guy by the name of Saul. Saul was a, was a religious leader who was hostile to the message of Jesus. Remember how we talked about Philip was fleeing Jerusalem because Stephen had been killed for his faith in the gospel? Well, a man who was complicit in Stephen's murder was the man that the scriptures are talking about right now. His name was Saul. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, which is to the north of Jerusalem. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the way of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up. Go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. When Paul, when God calls Saul, how many times does he call his name? Twice. When God calls Ananias, how many times does he call his name? Once. Why? My theory is that because Saul doesn't know Jesus, he needed to hear his name called a couple different times. But Ananias is already walking with Jesus. Jesus only has to call him once to get his attention. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Again, he's giving very specific instructions, just like he did to Philip. Go to this house and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Can you imagine? The Lord's like, hey, go to this house and pray for this person to be healed from blindness. P.S., I already told him you're coming. <laughs> Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias is saying, Lord, this is a bad idea. This man is a terrorist. Stephen's blood is on his hands, and now he's coming for me too. Do you have any idea what you're asking me to do? But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The Lord is saying, Ananias, don't worry. This guy Saul, he's going to become Paul. He's going to have plenty of opportunities to suffer for the gospel. Then Ananias went to the house. Can you imagine being Ananias just standing at the edge of the house? saying like, I might, not, I might not be alive on the other side of this moment. But if Jesus is at work in this residence, then I'll, I'm going to join him there. He went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Brother 
Saul. Has Saul apologized for any of the wrong that he's done? Has Saul decided yet to become a follower of Jesus? As far as, as, far as anybody in the room knows it, Ananias and Saul are still mortal enemies, and he puts his hands on him. I don't know if, it's, if you've ever had to forgive somebody. Sometimes if I have to forgive somebody, I'm happy to do it from a distance. The last thing I want to do is like put a hand on that person's shoulder. And Ananias touches him, and then he calls him what? He calls him brother. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. How long has Saul gone without eating? Three days. What does he do before he grabs breakfast? He gets baptized. Because before he takes care of the needs of his body, he is going to rectify the needs of his soul. Like the top thing on his list to do is to surrender all of who he is to this Jesus who has his attention. Have you ever noticed that when we follow God into new emotional pace, spaces, paces that, spaces that take us beyond our fear, beyond our insecurity, beyond our hatred and our hostility, when we follow God there, the people who were threats become brothers. The people who were strangers become friends. A few years ago, a buddy of mine said, hey, Steve, I want to do a men's retreat for people who aren't followers of Jesus in the Middle East. Would you like to come and speak? And I asked him a question that I know better than to ask now. I go, well, that's a part of the world where there is some animosity towards both Americans and Christians. I go, is it safe? And he goes, I don't know. He goes, all I know is that when you're speaking, I'll be the one seated closest to the door. So if everything goes left, I'll be out before you are. I was like, do you know that none of this is helpful, bro? <laughs> so we went to this country and spoke to these men over the course of a couple days. And when our time was done, through a translator, I said, thank you for allowing me to be your guest. At which point they all started to yell in Arabic. And I was like, oh no, here it is. Like, this is, this is it. And I asked the translator, I was like, what's wrong? And he's like, they're deeply offended that you consider yourself their guest because they consider you their brother. And I went into that place thinking what? That these people were threats to my well-being, even my existence. And when our time was done, they called me their friend. When we join God on mission, he changes the way that we think about everybody. That people are, are no longer threats, but they're men and women who are created in the image of God. They're not foreigners, they're potential family. They're not hostiles, they're potential brothers and sisters. So as God leads us, he leads us into new relational spaces, new emotional spaces, and finally leads us into new cultural spaces. Peter, who was one of the first followers of Jesus, was praying in a town called Joppa. You can still visit that town today. It's just outside of modern-day Tel Aviv. And the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go. Peter, here's a go. Just like Ananias heard go. Just like Philip heard go. Just like you and I will hear go. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. And the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. And Cornelius, as a Roman centurion, who is not yet a follower of Jesus, was expecting them. And he had called together all of his relatives and close friends. And as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. And while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was set for, I came without raising any objection May I ask why you sent for me? Peter went into a household that his tradition told him to avoid. Never in his adult life had he been in an immediate company with a Gentile and certainly never been into one of their homes. But what I love about the gospel is mission reminds us, what? Mission reminds us that mission trumps tradition always. Mission trumps tradition always. 
Somebody once told me that mission happens every time the story of Jesus crosses a boundary. And for Peter and his friends to go into a Gentile home was crossing a cultural boundary. And God was saying, you kept, this, you kept these lines in place for a season, for a reason, but I'm asking you to move past them now. Author Stephen Chalk told the story of a, of a group of American soldiers fighting in World War II, and one of them fell in battle, was killed in combat, and they asked if they could bury him in, a, in, the, in the churchyard of a small countryside church. And the priest said, unfortunately, he wasn't a member of our congregation, so you can't bury him in the cemetery, but you can bury him beyond the fence line of the cemetery. And while they were hurt and wounded and frustrated, they agreed to that set of requirements. But when the war was over, they came back to pay their respects to their friend, only to find out that his grave marker had disappeared. And filled with rage, they went to the priest and said, what happened? You said that we could bury our friend here, and now you removed his grave marker. He goes, actually, that's not true at all. After you left, I, I moved the fence. And now his grave is inside of the cemetery rather than just outside of it. This story reminds us that Jesus is in the business of what? Moving man-made fences to include people, to see people, to notice people, to invite people that had been overlooked, discarded, and neglected before. Cornelius answered three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon, and an angel, a man in shining clothes, stood before me and said, Cornelius, God heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation, every ethnicity, the one who fears him and does what is right. You know what I love about Cornelius, a Roman centurion? He goes, I pray that God would send me somebody like you, and he sent you. He goes, and now you're here. And then I love it. He said this. He goes, it was good of you to come. Do you know that every time you respond to Jesus on mission, he's going to bring you into the presence of somebody who needs Jesus more than you could ever hope to realize? And although they don't articulate this with their mouths, or maybe they don't think this with their brains, but what they're saying with their souls, the moment that you step into that space is exactly that. It was good of you to come. It was good of you to come. And there is somebody somewhere whose home is aching for the presence of Jesus that will arrive in and through you. But in order for that to happen, you have to be listening to hear go and you have to be willing to say yes. Later in the story, it says, surely, Cornelius said, surely no one can stand in the way of our being baptized with water. Actually, Peter says this. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So we follow God into new spaces. People who we had viewed as conquerors become co-laborers. When Kelly and I on our hike yesterday, I saw a, a woman wearing a t-shirt that said, it's now. And then there was a script, a word in the middle that I couldn't read from a distance, but I got closer and her shirt said, it's different now. And on the back, it said, baptized by transformation. Now, I don't know who transformation is or what's they're about, but they got it right. Because when people get baptized, they're declaring to the world, what? It's different now. I'm different now. Baptism is a marker of transformation. It shows that the mission to go to make disciples and to transform them into followers is happening. Philip goes to the chariot, and now the eunuch can say, it's different now. Ananias goes to where Saul is. Saul becomes Paul and says, it's different now. Peter goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius has changed and says, it's different now. Who will be able to say, it's different now because of you? See, as we go, we travel to places we otherwise would not find ourselves. None of these journeys required any of these people to have a passport. Some of them traveled a day or two distance. Some of them just traveled down the street. A friend of mine once said that in Matthew, Jesus tells us to go to the four corners of the earth, but because we didn't go, God took the corners of the earth and folded them into our cities. 
And Monterey is a place where God has brought the nations to our very doorstep through education, through the military, through the tech sector, through all others, through, through, through tourism. People from all over the planet are finding their way here. You don't need a passport to reach the nations. You just need feet that are ready to go. We never know how God may use our lives on mission to change a life, a family, or a legacy for his glory. In 1957, a Stanford engineering student and his friends went to heckle a preacher named Billy Graham, who was speaking at a crusade in San Francisco. But Graham's message stirred this young man's heart so much, he decided to show up the next day to hear him speak again at a Stanford campus chapel. And he says, I'll never forget the message. This message was on the measure of a human life. He said, Billy Graham explained that if you took all of the components that make up a human body, water, calcium, potassium, and other minerals, if you were to sell those for market value in 1957, it would have been the equivalent of about $2. But Billy Graham went on to say, but God sees so much value in you that he sent his only son to suffer and die so that you could be forgiven and changed, rose him again from the dead so that you could be risen to new life. And while that young man didn't make a faith decision, he carried that message with him into his future. He went on to get his PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering. He studied overseas. He also actually ended up working for NASA, developed the Saturn V rockets that put, put the Americans on the moon. He got married, settled down in suburban Chicago, and started attending a church that taught him what it meant to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Why does that story matter to me? Because that skeptical student was my father. And my brother and four sisters are, are able to have an appreciation for the person of who Jesus is and what he's done because of dad's faithfulness. And even though he passed a few years ago, his 17 grandkids, while they're all in different spaces in their faith journey, have an appreciation for the foundation of, of who the Jesus of the scriptures is. And my dad was only able to write the story for us that he was a part of writing because Billy Graham said yes to going into a space that he had never been before to, to present to an audience that had some hostile components in it to get out of his bubble, out of his comfort zone to say yes to mission. And I'm only here because that sequence of events happened in that order. You never know how one small act of obedience can transform one life or multiple generations until the other side of eternity. But no matter what sacrifices you make in the name of mission, you'll be able to look back at the end of your life and say, it was worth it, and I would do it all again. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that, that you crossed the gap of time and space and sin and evil in order to meet us where we are. You didn't ask us to come to you. You met us exactly where we were, in our dark places, in our broken places, in our lost and disorienting places. And you showed us what truth is. You showed us what love is. You showed us what redemption and mercy is. And for those of us who have that true in our story, will you give us the grace to pay it forward? Will you remind us that your mission has come to us so that your mission might flow through us? God, will you open our eyes to people who are in need of your love and your healing and your hope today and in the upcoming days so that every day we roll out of bed and every day we leave our house or dorm room or every day we walk down our block, we would walk with a heart that beats for you and eyes that are looking for people who don't yet know you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Thank Steve. You, Steve. Was very that was even more challenging the second time around, so thank you very much. Uh, I have one new announcement, uh, unlike our typical announcements that we have. That Pastor Steve talked about baptism a few different times during his message, and we at Shoreline Church believe the, the biblical idea of baptism. That is, once you've made a decision to follow Jesus, once you've accepted him as, as your Savior, 
The next step is to be baptized, to make a public declaration of this new life in Jesus. And today, right now, in the next 27 minutes at 1230, we're going to have a baptism class. And it's just where we'll talk a little bit more about baptism, about what it means. And if you have not been baptized, if you haven't taken that next step, I encourage you, please go to the class. It'll be located in the Peninsula Room, which is just right down the hall from from here, the Connection Center, they can point you in the right direction. And then on Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, if you're online or you can't make it at 12.30 today, we're going to do an online version of that same class. And all of the details are available on our website at shoreline.church. And as always, we would love to pray for you and pray with you. And so we'll have people up here at front who would love to pray for you. If you've got something on your heart, something that God is stirring in you, something that you need someone to join you in prayer for, please come on up. And if you're at home or you can't make it into the the worship center, you can just text the word prayer to the number that you'll have on your screen. And if you're new to Shoreline, we'd love to welcome you into this church and tell you more about it and see how you can get involved. If you're here on campus, we encourage you, if today's your first day or if you've been coming for months and just have never done it, stop by our Connection Center. They'd love to give you some more information about the church and help you get plugged in. And if you're at home, just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen and we'll give you a digital connection card. Well, we love to end every service by sending you off with a blessing. So if you're able, I would love to have you stand as I say a blessing for you. And in light of what we heard today and as is found in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. As you go from here, go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go to those places where it might be uncomfortable. Go to those places where God is urging you one step at a time. And just wait and see what God will do in you and through you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.